Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Simon, in your ears again. Okay, so I won't witter too much. This is episode seven. And this is the first Skype interview, which doesn't sound too bad, actually. This episode features the inspiring and enthusiastic Jem Henderson, who brightened my lockdown day with her big energy and positivity early on in this isolation process. She's a very smart, positive woman, and we cover a lot. Jem is the Entrepreneur Engagement Manager for Yorkshire at Tech Nation, which nurtures tech businesses in the region. You can follow her on Twitter at TN underscore Yorkshire. So I've got a really interesting work history um, yeah. in that I was homeless at 16, I've been a hairdresser, I've been a chef, I've been a painter and decorator, I was signed off sick for seven years um, and I've had two of my own businesses and I do this now. So it's pretty varied. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, are you, so shall I kind of get into kind of my, my set? I mean, it's not quite a formula at the moment, as I say, I want to try and kind of keep it a bit free form because I think you can't at the moment my feeling is that I can't kind of blanket apply sort of questions um to everyone because people are going to have different experiences so what I what I kind of normally start with or what I've been starting with recently is um uh, what did you want to be when you grew up as a as a basic <laughs> question <laughs> that is a good one so when I was a kid I wanted to be a newsreader Oh, and I used right. to practice with my bits of paper like this and fully go like, I'm going to get really good at this shuffling bits of paper, malarkey. I'm very good at it now. Um, uh, and then, I don't know, I had a pretty rough childhood. And so, and I don't think that schools are particularly well, I mean, certainly it's a long time since I was at school, let's be honest, but certainly yeah. it doesn't feel like they're well set up to talk about no. what jobs there are out there, particularly, I mean, I went, I'm, I'm from Harrogate, so you would think that that the schools there might be better informed, maybe because they're much more middle class. But I went to the I went to the poor person school there, yeah. um, and so you know we I can't even remember what the name of the program is that you used to you'd like put in what you like, and it would spit out, oh, you should become a bin man or a nurse, and that was yeah. basically it. Um, and I certainly think that when it comes to tech jobs. Um, we have a massive problem because teachers and even these programs, they don't know what tech jobs are. Um, and it's something actually that I'm kind of trying to tackle at work. Um, so there's a massive um, skills shortage in the tech industry where, you know, there's, there's just not enough people. They're, they're currently training up one person for, for the 20 jobs that are going to be out there in the future. But yeah. actually the way we think about work and the way we think about jobs is pretty poor. So for me, as a raging feminist, um, I think that the skills that we see, you know, maybe mums having, where they can manage all of these different things all at the same time, like the washing up's always done, the wash, the laundry's always done, you know, that's project management. And yeah. there's plenty of jobs out there for project managers. So how we phrase this uh, and how we think about this, hopefully in the future, will start to make people think, oh, actually, I don't just have to. I think for the working class, I don't just have to go into those traditional working class jobs, but I can think, I can sell myself in a different way. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I would agree. I think it's, um, it's kind of like we don't have the language for it yet. You know, like the, 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 the ways of describing it and then the ways of sort of transmitting that information to people isn't quite there in a way that people can grasp quickly. Um, how do we go into communities though so my my little boy today he's four years old and he said to his dad this morning i want to buy official.com so i can sell my artwork and like that's him he's four so mm. like we've bought it we've set up a little wordpress and he is now like building himself a little little website but he's very lucky he is growing up in this very tech savvy household i think you know we're nerds i mean that's a thing so 
whilst we're both very working class, we are privileged in our knowledge um, and that will hopefully help him in the future. But if you're grow up, growing up in a household that doesn't have that, then where is where's the space for people to be educated on what jobs are in the future? Because I just don't think it's school. Yeah. And, and, and it appears to be, or, or what I what I kind of receive from other media is that when people are thinking about that, or they're thinking about tech jobs, they're thinking that they're going to invent some killer app and make a fortune and be millionaires, and, and that's it. Or they think, I'm going to start a YouTube channel and I'll make money off that. But it, it, it's, always, it's always a very narrow view, you know, like people don't think about all the other. So, for example, like I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Like my passion has always been film. I've like I've, I've worked on short films. I've worked on low budget films. I've done my own stuff, um, but you know I, I I never pursued it like you know with a full on obsession determination. I was always hedging my bets, so that kind of held me back in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, where am I going with this? So yeah, I, I, I but then you, it, you my thought in terms of film filmmaking generally was you know the visible bits actor director producer writer like not script reader or continuity or the so, yeah, people I've, that like are there yeah go on i've just i've just seen leeds trinity have just started a course um and it's like a short course it's pretty cheap and it's about production designers like that's yeah. amazing i love leeds trinity i think the work that they do kind of in working class inclusion is really strong and stuff like that to me is amazing you know we've got channel four coming here that has brought a bunch of production companies to to leeds and so yeah there's a real opportunity there um you know go forward and hopefully we will see more of this i think that the stuff that leeds city council does around digital inclusion is amazing you know I I'm, I'm very lucky I get to sit at the table with the council I get to sit on the steering boards and I get to go more working class people yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may see it it's in the papers I just I got in trouble actually I um uh, the last year's Leeds Digital Festival Stuart Clark put out a piece uh, in the Yorkshire Post talking about you know not working class people in tech and I like fully doubled down on it in the paper and yeah I got in a bit of trouble it was like well that's not the government line I'm like I don't care it's my line like that's really yeah. vitally important to me um uh, I was supposed to be putting on an event in fact at this year's Leeds Digital Festival which is obviously unfortunately not happening for a while but we're specifically talking about social mobility because it is just something that I'm so passionate about um daily um I mean even now so this situation with the the coronavirus stuff that we have happening all around us my my housemate um is off sick until the 4th of April but she can't she can't qualify for the 80 percent of her wages because it's just the system's not set up for that my yeah. my partner who is a film student who works is um doesn't earn enough money to be included in the government's 80 percent thing so he is now having to navigate the universal credit system not for the first time in his life but there's like half a million people trying to sign up for this right now so that's just just not working and yeah it's really frustrating and annoying to see that i guess for working class people this is just there are going to be middle class people coming into the system going this system is insane how like and we've yeah. been saying that for years, right? Like we've been yeah, saying yeah. this is not good enough. I was signed off sick for seven years. Um, I actually feel quite lucky. I was signed off sick in the um, in the labour years, um, which meant that there was kind of support for me. Uh, there yeah. was mental, there was mental health support. Um, I was eligible for disabled living allowance, which meant that I got more housing benefit and all this other stuff. Right now, you know this this system. Is supposed to be a safety net and it's full of holes and it's terrifying well yeah i mean it, it, it seems to me more uh to be not so much a safety net as as, as just a, a way to kind of drive people down when you do discuss work you discuss it in a very kind of narrow set of parameters you know yeah uh, a lot of it in the uk is like bitching about work like oh it's monday so we've got to go in oh we all hate work and it's like but we don't as well. Loads of people love their job. I and love I've spoken to a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. I, I absolutely love my job. I know, like, this is, 
I've loved my jobs for the last few years. I feel so lucky. I mean, I kind of, when I was a painter and decorator, um, I'd be painting the outside of houses. And honestly, when the weather's like this, it's amazing. You just like put your headphones in, you just do the job. It's no stress. The money's all right. And I, I loved that. But, you know, then it rains and you've still got to be outside and you know, it's not quite the same. Whereas this job, like in my interview for this job, so I'm the entrepreneur engagement manager for Yorkshire for Tech Nation. Um, and my interview for this job, I literally told my boss's boss now, um, two minutes into the video interview, like I am the perfect person for this job. You know that, right? Um, and he was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> um, so like, because part of the most, there's kind of two halves to my job as it is now. So there's um, Tech Nation do a whole bunch of programs for um, for growing tech businesses, um, ranging from the Founders Network, which is like a peer to peer channel that people can kind of talk about their issues and work through stuff and share opportunities um, through to then we've got the scaling programs specifically looking at AI, cybersecurity and fintech. Then we've got upscale, which is like bigger businesses that have, you know, got, I think it's 1.5 mil of revenue or have raised um, like 3.5 mil. Um, and it's just about getting those people who are all in that same boat to sit in a room together and kind of share their issues, get some advice from 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 people who've been there before. Um, so, yeah, like and I'm really pleased to be able to deliver that because it's free, which to me, I'm not a salesperson. I, like I can't do sales. I just feel like I'm shamming people. <laughs> it's just yeah. not my nature. I'm not commercially minded. Um, whereas, you know, this is free and it's genuinely helpful. And, you know, I've had feedback from companies that we had on programs last year who have said to me, you know, this getting on this program was pivotal for us. It has absolutely taken our business to the next level. So there's like a massive pride in that. I also managed to speaking to iwaka who have just um, opened an office up in leeds um you know i was part of that introduction to the leeds ecosystem for them which has now created 100 jobs in this city like well-paid skilled jobs so like it's jet there's a genuine pride there but then the other half of my job is is what i like to call digital gossip so that is um like going out talking to everybody across yorkshire and i literally mean everybody i will pretty much take anybody's call um and go for a coffee because there's always something i can do to help whether it's connecting them to an accelerator whether it's just getting them to chat to somebody that i already know just just something but i do that in like my normal everyday life like when people say things to me I'm like oh you should do this thing or that thing so i've basically found a job which is paying me to do what I already do anyway. I mean, that is yeah. the dream, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of my perspective as well. That's like part of the reason that I'm doing this is, you know, uh, I because I've been out of the city for a long time, like I've, I've seen, so friends that I'm still in contact with, you know, like my friends that I stayed in touch with from home. And I kind of came back into that social group, but not as well because I'd been out of the city for a very long time. So, my social circle shrank and also those those people they have much bigger social circles now because they've been meeting people here and building new networks and sort of uh, all that going on and I, I feel like why do I not know anybody find your pub right this is my advice find your pub because everyone's got like a sort of style of pub right I like a pub I don't like a bar I'm not that much of a I don't like cocktails I like beer I don't even really like particularly I don't really like craft beer anymore i used to be like oh sour beer <laughs> but no i like <laughs> roosters local proper beer um i've really got into wrestling so really? like there is there is this organization locally they're called rise um uh, which stands for radical innovations in sports entertainment it's been going for five years i went i went to their session i went to summer session at the brudenell it was like my marriage was just breaking up and one of my mates invited me and it's I was like, I'm going to hate that. I'm there. I'm so there. It's just not my thing. I'm going to push myself like fully out of my comfort zone. It was the best night out I've had, like in the, such a long time. Um, yeah. It was ridiculous. Like just drink cheap lager and shout, uh, shout abuse at people. <laughs> totally acceptable. <laughs> it's fine. Like it was genuinely the most punk rock thing I've ever done. 
Yeah. Uh, and and I went to the next one, and I went to the next one, and like now I I I'm now subscribed to their Patreon to make sure that they can keep going through the shutdown because. Yeah. They, I don't even go to gigs anymore. I just go to the wrestling. Like I'm friends with them <laughs> on Facebook now. Um, we've been chatting. I'm like, is this a parasocial relationship? No. One of them offered. One of the wrestlers offered to bring me food when I was like self isolating for 14 days. Like these yeah. are really nice people who genuinely care. So yeah, just new hobby. That's the way to make new friends. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I've waxed lyrical about the wrestling. Every work meeting I've had recently has done this as well. <laughs> Oh, you've disappeared. I don't think you can call um, wrestlers essential workers, which is massively sad. So they've now shifted to showing some old matches, but then doing like video interviews. Um, yeah. Like it's been, it's been really interesting to kind of watch that kind of fluid thing having to kind of happen in front of our eyes. Whereas I yeah. guess we're not really seeing it for a lot of businesses, bar and supermarkets, running out of blue roll and stuff. There are, there are so many moving parts to this situation right now that, mm. uh, yeah, it's all pretty stressful. Like I said, I subscribe to the Patreon just to kind of uh, help them keep going. In fact, what one of the really cool things they did was it was a pay what you feel, send us your photo, and we'll do you a cardboard cutout of your face in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> there. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Um, right, so before we go any further, I should probably just check like your time and availability, like how much time you actually do I have. I have nothing else to do today. Okay, cool. Because um, I didn't want to keep you if you had stuff to do. No, no, I'm, so... I'm, I am working from home, but I guess that that is different to normal work, isn't it? So. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I would imagine that you do a fair bit of work from home as well, though. We so we, um, Tech Nation specifically actually asks us to do like one one day a week from home just to yeah. to chill out and actually for our team um, like the people that do my job across the country one of the things that Tech Nation are genuinely phenomenal for is if I have to go to an event and there's like a hundred people there that I am like talking to and shaking hands with and chatting to like that is exhausting in a way yeah. that you know, sitting in an office and typing out a blog or whatever, it just isn't. And our yeah. work is very like, they're, they're very understanding that if you've done that and then the next day you kind of just need to do a tiny little bit of admin but sit on the sofa and not really think about anything, like they're totally fine for us to do that because it is really hard. You know, you have to be on all the time. Like for me, my brain has to be literally from the minute I start talking to you going, Right, so I should do you that, I should introduce you to that person, I should, and, and just that, like that processing, and it's quite tiring. So if you're going to do that for yeah. 100 people, ooh! <laughs> yeah. um, but the Tech Nation have been amazing during this um, this coronavirus crisis, shall we call it? So like they've given us, um, there's a woman on the exec team, which I think has made a massive difference to uh, how the company has responded. So we have been given five days extra paid leave to be taken like over this, the course of however long we're off, um, yeah. to ensure that either kids that need looking after can, can the arrangements can be made for what that looks like, or if somebody has elderly parents who might need stuff doing, and you can take it in like hour long chunk this leave. So if you just, you know, you need to get off for an hour because you need to go and take your mum some milk or whatever it looks like, it's, yeah. it's happening and that has, I genuinely believe that that's because we have a woman on the exec team and she has gone, no, what you're suggesting isn't good enough. You haven't taken this, in, this into account. You need to think about this in a different way. So it's been really helpful, I think. Um, I, I keep seeing memes floating about the internet which say, next time you go for a job interview, when they say, do you have any questions? You should ask them, what did you do for your staff during the coronavirus stuff? Like, the, that's really telling. Um, I actually, I was dealing with... I had a girl, never met her before in my life. She was on Facebook and she was saying that she worked for this company and they were making her go to work. Um, they were calling her a telecommunications person, even though she just worked in digital marketing. Um, so I like worked really hard. I spoke to somebody at the council about what she should do to report this company. And like in the end, this guy sent them all home with no pay and no and no sick pay and none of this 80% furloughed stuff. But like, yeah. and then I've given her some more resources to try and like, go, well, these are the people you should speak to about that. Um, 
but it's insane. Like we can really see like the good companies from bad companies right now, and who we should be who we should be working for, and who we absolutely shouldn't. And hopefully that will the repercussions of what is happening right now will be really good for the labour market. So there are people in government that say, you know, you can't have a visa for this country if you work in these unimportant jobs. So we, care workers get paid like 20 grand a year, so they're not eligible to come over right now as it stands. And then suddenly, right, you know, right now, it's care workers, it's nurses, it's you know, people that work in supermarkets. These are our essential workers. Cleaners. Cleaners. Profit is built on the back of these people. And it's mm -hmm. so demonstrated right now because because these people should be getting paid way more than they are because they are the people that are holding society together. Mm. Oh, the workers. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree entirely. But I, it also shows as well the sort of, the again, that narrow perspective of like there are only, you know, there are only 12 jobs in the world. Like, so, you know, the, all of the people through supply chains and so on that are just like, oh, that that thing that's not going to work anymore that's not going to happen anymore now we can't do that now you know like the penny starts to drop Amazon, as you, these Amazon things go delivery. away one second yeah. Amazon delivery <laughs> still by hair dye in a crisis it's fine got to keep this up <laughs> okay so should we, should we go backwards a bit? Like, yeah. you know, you said you had plenty of jobs. So what, what was your first job? My first ever job was uh, working in a florist. Um, it was kind of a ridiculous introduction to work. I worked there anyway on a Saturday. Um, I worked there for my work experience at school, mm -hmm. except there wasn't really very much to do. And my boss was amazing. And what actually happened for work experience was there was a pub next door, so like I'd go in at 11, we'd get a beer at 12, and I would go home at 2. So perhaps <laughs> not the greatest of introductions to the world of work. Um, but I, I mean, I got my first job when I was 14 working in, in, a, in, in a flower shop. Um, I did a little qualification in flower arranging at college with a bunch of old yeah. ladies as a 14-year-old, which was very exciting. Um, then... Uh, I got kicked out of home, uh, and that was that was a do. So I was homeless. Um, I went on the dole at 16, um, and looking for jobs at that point in time. So I'd look at apprenticeships, but apprenticeships paid 40 pound a week. Yeah. I was, I, I, well, how can you live on 40 pound a week? Like it's yeah. just not a thing. So I, I looked. The best paid apprenticeship was being a hairdresser at Tony and Guy. Um, so I went and did that for, for, I mean, I didn't last there. I am not Tony and Guy hairdresser sort of material, if I'm honest. Um, I tried. Uh, I went and worked for another hairdressers, but I then got, I got fired for, it was around the time of the Jubilee <clears throat> and I, I didn't have a telly and like, I'm washing these old ladies hair and they're like, Oh, did you watch, did you watch the Jubilee on telly? And I was like, no, I don't have a telly. And I basically got told off for not having a telly. And I was like, dude, I live in a homeless hostel. What do you want me to do? I don't, I don't have the £10 a month that it is for me to have a TV licence. You don't pay me enough. What? Yeah. Um, then I, I became a painter and decorator. I went to um, Leeds College of Building for a year. Um, was that a job or was yeah, that? Yeah, no, it right. was, yeah so I did, I did that for about a year. Had a bit of a fallout with my first boss. Uh, and then I went to work for, for a company in Harrogate who were genuinely amazing. I loved it. They did like really high end kitchen renovations. You paint all the cabinets and stuff. Um, yeah. But I basically had a complete and utter mental breakdown um, since when I was 19. Um, and yeah, just went, just lost the plot. And um, when I got signed off sick for a month and I went to go back to work and I sat down with my boss in, in, in their kitchen, they were a married couple, and he had been an ex-mental health nurse. When I said, yeah, I'm fine, I can come back to work, he just went, no. Um, <laughs> not because he was like, you can't come back to work, but he was just like, you're not well enough to work. Like, yeah, you're not ready. time, like, go through, I had PTSD, basically, from my upbringing, so I had to work through that. And actually, I don't want to slight any painter and decorators 
but I am going to tell this story. My boss was like, Jem, what are you doing? You kind of, you're a bit too smart to be a painter and decorator. Go, go to university. Um, yeah. I'm like, I did. So I got signed up sick. I was signed up sick for, um, like seven years, but I did three degrees. So I did a visual arts. So I started out, I did like a course to get into, to onto a degree. So I did an art course, did a visual arts degree. Uh, then I did an English literature degree. Um, I was really lucky actually, um, as part of my art stuff, I would write poetry. And one day we got a creative writing teacher in and I'm fairly certain that my tutor deliberately got this person in to make me rethink what I was doing. So we had this task where there was a whole bunch of photos in the middle of the table and you had to pick one and write about what it was like for that person to wake up in the morning. So I picked this picture of an old man and I wrote this little story and I finished before everyone else. And he was like, okay, write about what it's like for them to go to bed. And I did it. And I finished before everyone else had even done the first one. And this creative writing tutor, who's a guy called Ray, I'm actually friends with him on Facebook now, I had to thank him. He came over and I think he just thought, this is just going to be a bag of shit. And um, he picked it up and he read it and he looked at me and he looked at it and he went, what are you doing art for? Go do English. And I was like, oh, right. Oh, okay. So yeah, I um, I went over to York St. John. I did an English literature degree. I ended up doing a creative writing master's. Uh, and then two weeks after I handed in my final dissertation for my master's, I had a job as a copywriter working in tech um, at a data center in Harrogate. So I guess I was quite lucky. Um, I don't quite know how I've managed to like gl gloss. I didn't have seven years out of work. I was doing university stuff. It's fine. And no one's ever gone. Well, how are you paying for that? It's fine. It's fine. Um, so I, I'm quite lucky there because it doesn't look like a hole in my CV, even though it really was. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so I went from there, did, did, did that. I was finding that I was finishing all my work, like my week's work by like Tuesday. And I'd go to my boss and be like, what else is there to do? And they'd be like, I don't know. So I set up my own copywriting company. I was doing that three days a week during my work. Um, and then I got made redundant and I was like, if I can do a full week's work in two days, I might as well be a freelancer that is doing that and getting paid for a week's work in two days as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, <laughs> that was kind of the beginning of it. At first I was writing articles about absolute nonsense, like my, my holiday that I've just taken in Cyprus for, for this like content agency, it was 10 quid for an article. Like it was absolute like drone work, but because I, I read super fast so I can really like churn out stuff pretty quickly. And I went from there to to like doing stuff for digital marketing agencies around Harrogate and Leeds. Then um, I guess I got my big break uh, when I met a lady um, who I, is one of my really good friends now uh, called she was the head of um, the Internet of Things at at that time and she wanted a writer to come and like write, write blogs for her but not like as a ghost writer she genuinely genuinely was like no like your name is going on these things I, I will give you direction and I will edit them but I if you're writing them I want you to get the credit so I started writing for her and I essentially did a tech apprenticeship with her so I was writing about AI I was writing about blockchain I was writing about the internet of things and then I met her when I was 36 weeks pregnant so Obviously, she actually rang me when I like when Ross was born, uh, like ten weeks after, and she was like, "Hi, you bored yet? Do you want anything to do?" And I was just like, "Oh my God, please give me something to do that isn't looking after a potato that poos." <laughs> so um, yeah, so she she then moved over to working at Digital Catapult, and after after a time, you know, I needed more to do. I needed to be bringing money into the house, um, so I. I guess I then went, okay, well, we got any more work for me? And she got me the job as the as the community manager for Digital Catapult's IoT UK program. I mean, that was just jaw dropping for me, frankly, because it, it introduced me to a whole different strata of workers. So everybody at Digital Catapult is like XBBC, XGuardian, you know, frankly, privileged middle-class people. Um, I remember I went in because I used I'd only go down to the office in London at King's Cross like once a month and I rocked up with my hair like this and the CEO nearly fell over like he was just like what are you I'm like I'm good at my job so um, <laughs> yeah it was actually quite 
it was amazing. I'm genuinely thankful I had that opportunity because I think there are, I don't want to say this in a way that sounds bitter, I think there are plenty of people who are working class like me. Like I grew up in a single parent household. My mum was on benefits. She was disabled. Like I went to a, I mean, I went to a school in Harrogate, so it wasn't really bad, but it wasn't the best school. Yeah. I didn't do my A-levels um, because. And you kind of stick out you know with those, well, those circumstances <laughs> at school anyway unless you, you unless you're like you know being i'm the really cool hyper cool rebellion kid then you you know you you're kind of especially high school it's like that's where all your social economic the only goth in high school. Is. yeah it, it was that's it no one's going to talk to you then i guess <laughs> but i so i was incredibly lucky to suddenly go from like working you know, in these really working class jobs as a decorator or as a, as a as a chef I did for a bit, like all sorts, to suddenly working in a room full of people that have worked for the BBC and The Guardian and stuff. And it was like, I knew, I got, I don't get me wrong, I had imposter syndrome for a while, but after a while I suddenly went, hang on a minute, like I am, I am definitely as good as, as these people. And like, actually because of the trauma of my upbringing and because of like, like poverty gives you a resilience which yeah. these people just have no idea so like you already are starting if if you can kind of get over your issues which thankfully i, I did you're starting from a place which is incredibly strong um mm. and so I, I like i genuinely flourished at digital catapult um i went from kind of just doing like twitter stuff to i became a product manager for a for a a machine learning product um, and I was like acting as the go-between between between the program and I was working with the universities to ensure that the message they were kind of giving out was communicated to government and it was just like something else Um, and yeah that that was I wish I wish that opportunity I wish that opportunity could be handed to to everybody that is capable of it whether that's because they had they just the opportunity is, is open or whether that's because they have the confidence to just apply for it right mm-hmm. i don't know how we get there i think we have a massive issue when it comes to social mobility but i hope that you know doing stuff like this and chatting about it really demonstrates that people start to need to start thinking differently about about this about social mobility about working class people in professional roles because Damn it, we're bloody great. <laughs> <laughs> and how you get into it. I want to I go back a little bit. So just to, like, from the copywriting, um, starting your own business. So what made you do that, think that you could do it, and make it a success? So... I'm guessing you had, like, some, some support there and some encouragement within it. So... I just, no, to be honest, no. Like I am no. just, I am a doer, right? Like I genuinely, there are there are kind of two people in the two kinds of people in the world. There are people that talk about stuff, and then there are people that just do it, right? I just do it, and like, so I had this, I kind of had this business going because I was bored. Like I have, mm. I think I've probably got ADHD, mm. like genuinely, uh, and I just need input all the time or I just mm. go mental. I think part of the reason that I went crackers when I was younger was because I wasn't getting enough distraction from my own nonsense. Um, so that, not having a telly, that is a definitely, I haven't had a telly ever really. In fact, the house <laughs> I live in right now has a TV license because all bills are included and it is the first time in my entire life that that is a thing. Mm. It's crazy. A TV license, um, but yeah, because, because I don't have a TV, like don't be wrong, the advent of Netflix has definitely meant that I've watched way more stuff than I used to. But I just didn't. I just, yeah. I'd rather be doing stuff than passively ingesting it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that was it. But encouragement-wise, it was my own fear. Like mm-hmm. I've been poor. I've you know I've begged on the streets because I didn't have any money to eat. That is an incredible encouragement to 
to succeed. So whenever I would like finish a job or if I lost a client or whatever that looked like, I would take that anxiety and I would take that worry and I would channel it into something else. And I'd send out 10 emails to 10 different agencies and go, hi, I'm brilliant. Here's some of my work. Um, and, and then would just get to find the next piece. I'd use that stress as a way of pushing myself forward. Um, so, but what? Go on, sorry. I didn't want to, I didn't want to work for somebody else again because you know like so working in this office it's like a super corporate office i had to wear like real shoes and mm. dresses and cover my tattoos and i couldn't have hair like this and like it, it's just not me right and yeah and i just i i have to be like this <laughs> like yeah, i know that sounds yeah. ridiculous but it it makes me feel comfortable true. no true yeah. like being true to myself um yeah. so i guess it was just about finding a role like if i'm just emailing companies to get work they don't know that i've got pink hair and finger tattoos right yeah, yeah. and then i'm lucky because i've got to a point where i've proved myself and now if i walk into a room with a with somebody like it happens to me quite a lot actually i walk into a room with a founder or with a usually with a like a city stakeholder and they look at me and they go oh you're that thing and then i start talking and suddenly they're like oh hang on a minute you're not that thing and because i've broken that perception they suddenly become much more honest with me than i think they are with a lot of other people because yeah. that subversion of their expectations breaks down something in their head and makes them talk more honestly and it's amazing mm. so I'm not changing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, as well, I think with the, would you say it's fair that with the copywriting, because you were doing all the tech stuff, did that kind of, that's kind of you steer into this and into that, that world? Yeah. I mean, like, did you, did you pick it? Did you have a big interest, a keen interest in technology I mean, before you got into it? I am a nerd. Um, in fact, if you go on my, if, um, and, a, and a geek in fact both of those things so i like the actual hardware tech ai nonsense but i also as i've already said love star trek i do like a lot it's a bit ridiculous i actually have a star trek badge that i wear for networking things so that when people can start talking to me they'll talk to me about star trek instead of about whatever boring stuff they want to talk to me about um yeah. it's a good it's a good opener um but so for me like working in tech is it's bringing about this future that star trek promises it's about building the foundation for the federation and for starfleet and it's super exciting so i guess it was inevitable don't be wrong i've written about like hair loss treatment and i've written as i said about holidays and um i've, I've, I've worked with a crazy amount of clients i actually work for a male feminist saudi arabian academic i edited his book um I have no idea how he found me, but I was so the right person. Cause I was just like, this is amazing. You're writing the feminist stuff. <laughs> anyway, so he, I'm going to thank you in his book, which is amazing. Um, so I, I, I don't get me wrong. I still quite like the academic -y stuff. A lot of the work I was doing with, with the universities at um, IOT UK was kind of translating academic speech into human. Um, and, but yeah, tech is, tech's fascinating. I, I remember going for an interview for a fashion brand, um, a, a fashion agency, and they were just writing about like, I don't know, shampoo and, and that's fine, but I don't care. I don't care about you. You've made up some name for some chemical, which you're pretending is going to make your skin beautiful for an extra three years of your life. And I get like, I don't like marketing in so much to me, tech, even if you're marketing, tech you're marketing the future you're not mm. just marketing a product right so that is really that was really enticing to me i guess and um i'm, I'm very lucky to get to still like one of the best things about my job is i go out and i talk i'll talk to a founder of a tech business and they'll be solving a problem that i never knew the world had in an absolutely yeah. ingenious way and those conversations are just like wow i've never even thought about that so for example there's a company over in lincoln called tended their founder, Leo, would go off and do work in like uh, places that had been hit by um, earthquakes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he came up with like this little wearable that you put on your wrist to to monitor people to make sure that they weren't you know, in trouble and they could find them if they were and that sort of thing. 
And, and that's an amazing, that's an amazing thing to have done. It's a great idea. But then he did a whole bunch of work with like Rolls Royce. And now that wearable is being used in factories to monitor for like slip trips accidents, but they're also using AI to see where those near misses are happening so that the safety procedures can be put into place to make sure those accidents that might happen never happen at all. Like mm -hmm. that's genius. And like mm -hmm. just talking to him about that is so, like I'd never even thought about that. And like learning about how he pivoted the company, it's fascinating. Um, I'm a storyteller and setting up companies, it's a story whatever that story is and so like teasing that out of people i love it it's great um yeah and that's what that's kind of what copywriting is obviously you've got to you've got to tell you've got to tell a story you've got to, to sell something to somebody you've got to make them engage with it on an emotional level and so that's that's why i was doing it i think god i'm like some kind of hippie bard just <laughs> <laughs> i was going to ask you on like so there's two things firstly uh obviously there's a big issue around diversity within tech mm -hmm. and like systems that are being designed and how there's you know the sort of lack of thinking again just this there are only sort of 12 types of jobs in the world kind of thinking um and also uh in terms of your your knowledge because people generally my experience of tech people is like they're either on the the hard edge sort of coding side or on the or or on the more kind of design end side mm -hmm. so like um how where's your knowledge lying is it more in the storytelling or are you like are you really good with the the kind of the details of the technical bits and the code and the infrastructure of it I don't I don't need to know like how you coded your algorithm I don't need to know what language you're using to generate your stuff I don't need to know if you're working front end or back end I don't need to know any of that stuff I have an understanding of it because I'm interested in it but I'm not it's quite interesting the place that I sit is essentially a foot in both camps so it's a foot in the creative camp and it's a foot in the technical side of it so I can I can talk to both of those types of people and that mm -hmm. has been really really valuable because like you say people are one or the other to be mm -hmm. a chameleon to be able to sit in the middle of those is is a skill and actually everybody on my team is that that we all have this kind of ability to to meld into whatever type of conversation we should be having um so i think it's a bit of a false distinction as well though because you kind of get the same with like you know you think of film and it's like the craft people who are, you know, I don't mean the food people, I mean like the craftsmen, the technicians, yeah. and then the, the other section sort of is the, the artistry, and then there's another section that's sort of... You, have to, the you, have, to have, people a, you have to be able to pull them think, yeah. those things. Um, I think you need to be quite holistic. Yeah. Exactly, but I think that, I definitely think it's a, it's a spectrum, right, of, and, and, and to be able to shift around on that is really, really valuable. Um, Back to the kind of point around diversity. Oh, I can wax lyrical about this for days. Um, yeah, I mean, diversity is such a massive issue in the tech in the tech industry. So, 19% of the roles that we see are in the tech industry are filled by women. I mean, that's shameful, right? Mm. How how how? But I think it's this perception. I know we have all of these initiatives around STEM now and getting STEMettes and getting girls into tech and getting girls into science and all that stuff but I don't necessarily think that that's good enough so I read a statistic or it wasn't a statistic it was a, a, probably an anecdote um, which said that when girls start school uh, like reception year if you get them say who's brilliant in this room everyone will pull their hand up because you know they're all four and five-year-olds think they're brilliant if you get to like seven years old and you ask that same question only the boys will put their hands up mm. so as it stands right now, we have this perception problem with tech where tech is for brilliant people. Mm. And if you don't think you're brilliant because you're seven years old, you suddenly go, well, I'm not brilliant. Then then we're just, these issues are gonna continue to, to, to be in place. Yeah. Um, and so that's why, you know, like I said earlier, where we were talking about how we change how people think about tech is really vital. 
Um, we have we've been having this debate at, at, in Tech Nation about the word ambitious because we, you know, in a lot of our taglines and a lot of our content, we say we're looking for ambitious tech entre entrepreneurs. But actually, ambitious can be seen as a gendered word, which is mental, really, because the words mm. have gender, but they kind of do. So words like mm. brilliant, exceptional um, and ambitious are words that that masculine kind of they have a masculine connotation um yeah. a, a really good example of how this plays out is so when you see adverts for, for working at google or amazon they include those words you know mm. whereas there are some companies that are doing it completely differently i think monzo is a good example and slack whereas when they're talking about roles and, and they're ta they talk about the community and they talk about support and they talk about words that we perceive as feminine and so they're actually getting a much better mix of applicants because mm -hmm. they're they're thinking about the language that that, that they use and we were, we're delving wildly into structuralism right now it's all very academic <laughs> but, no but it, it's good and i think well it, it it is but it's also specific as well so i'm wondering in terms of um like the actual qualification do you know the stats around uh, the gender balance of the study of IT and, and, and that kind of stuff in terms of, because I can imagine there's a lot more balance there than there is in the actual working and the actual industry. So that, because you know that thing of like law is the most, uh, it's the degree most people have and it's the degree that most people don't use. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, most people who have a law degree don't work in law. So I imagine there's a bit of that with, IT based stuff that people do, you know, women do study it, that diverse, that more diverse people are in the programs of learning about it. But in terms of the employment and working in those sectors and those industries that it just replicates of being, you know, pale, male, stale. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely true. You see it with, um, you know, where people have applied for jobs and they might have a name which is not a traditional white British probably male name and you know they're just they're just weeded out at that point oh mm. I, I can't pronounce that so I'm not going to invite you for an interview which is bonkers right it's absolutely bonkers because we're, we're going to be missing the best people mm. just because of our inbuilt biases but I know there's a lot of work happening like right now in HR around how we tackle these unconscious biases um but I don't I don't I don't see it being fixed like tomorrow for example um i i work really hard to keep myself up to date with with just anything so for example i, I would never walk into a room now and say hey guys like just no 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 mm. that's not okay i will always say hey folks how are you um and just constantly policing myself and you know as much as it is derided on the internet oh you're just a social justice warrior like no like intersectionality to me is absolutely vital um in how we and how we communicate but it needs to be so this is me doing it from a grassroots level how do we educate like those at the top so there were more men called john in the FTSE, whatever like on the board level than there are women yeah that's what but we've already, you know, I've already discussed how us having somebody, you know, having a woman on our exec team has made the company better. So Tech Nation is a better place to work because there is a woman at a high level. Um, we see it constantly. I, I ran a workshop on, on diversity um, at a conference in Denmark um, uh, last year. God, you remember you could go on planes and go other places. It was great, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, it was it was really it was actually fascinating. It was so I kind of had to dig into all these stats and you know companies where they have a gender balance at board level are like I think it's fifteen percent more productive. Companies that have a, a diverse more diverse board when it comes to people of color they're like thirty five percent more productive. This is not like small stuff. This is huge numbers really. Um, that workshop was actually amazing. So. Uh, Basically, I'll, I'll give it to you for free. Um, I got everyone to sit down in, in a circle and write five experiences from their lives that have made them the person that they are today. So everyone did that. And then I said, right, you everyone's got to read out three. Um, 
it, so it was quite it was pretty intimate and and it was fascinating so there was one girl that had been in care and you know one guy who had, had like separated from his parents very young or and somebody else who would like i was having like huge issues and in, in with a divorce mm -hmm. and by breaking down these barriers um and talking about themselves suddenly we started talking about diversity in a way that was like really meaningful because you know all of these people that are in kind of high-end jobs and come from all these different backgrounds and if you can start to see that having a more diverse background suddenly creates better conversation and more innovation mm. that's how we're going to fix this but you know all those people chose to be in that room and have that conversation so that's episode seven like this share it and do some online labor for me more importantly tell your in real life colleagues and neighbors about this tell every lawyer you know about this more so than that get in touch this is only going to work if i can continue to get guests you can DM me on Twitter at Western Studios 2, Instagram me, Western underscore studios underscore leads, or I have a secure email, Western Studios at protonmail.com, or just Skype me at Working Hours Podcast. We all tell ourselves stories about ourselves. Why shouldn't Leeds tell its story? Your stories. Take care, best of luck, work together, and let's do something different on the other side of this current crisis.